Check, check. Rock and roll. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the end of the first day of the Egg Food Show. I'm uh, very happy to be here to, to do a double demo in one to end off the day with a bit of a bang. So today we're going to show you how to use chicken livers to make a nice pate. And then we're also going to do a beautiful, easy to make crusty bread at home um, to go with the pate. And then later on, tomorrow, we'll be doing other recipes that with the pate and with the bread and with the pickled vegetables we've done, you'll be able to make a nice charcuterie board to share with friends and family. Include some cheese from Five Brothers and the you know, chicken livers from, from uh, Newfoundland grown chickens, um, vegetables pickled from here in the province. So I'm gonna start off by doing the pate and then we're gonna move into the bread. So chicken liver pate is very easy to make. Um, you do need a food processor, which anyone will do. It doesn't have to be powerful or great or fancy, just a basic food processor. Um, and then you gotta follow some basic technique, all right? So we're gonna go through that today. So <clears throat> with pate, you want it to be rich, you want it to be creamy, um, and you definitely don't wanna overcook the livers, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is melt a little bit of butter into a pan. Just trying to control that heat a little bit. And then we're gonna soften a little bit of shallot or onion. Either, either is fine. Shallot's a little nicer, it's just a little sweeter, and it's not as, as uh, harsh as a regular uh, white onion. Be careful not to burn your butter, which is what I'm doing here now. Um, so just soften that out. I like to add a nice, if I've got, if you've got it, great. If not, you don't need to, but a nice, this is a bit of lemon thyme that we picked up at Lester's. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of lemon thyme and kind of let that thyme go through in the butter. And then once I got a nice little saute and the, the butter is foaming and the onions are starting to soften, I'm gonna add my livers. Now, when you do your livers, um, you wanna make sure that you remove the membrane. It's pretty easy, just you'll see it, it's clear, just cut it off and remove it. And that way you're left with just the liver, okay? And I know people are like, ooh, gross, it's delicious. Absolutely delicious when it's done right. So we're just gonna add those livers on top of the onion and we wanna make sure we get color. Color is key. Color is flavor, but we don't wanna overdo it. Okay. I'll throw those in there. So one thing that you wanna make sure is you got the right size pan. You don't wanna overcrowd your pan if you overcrowd your pan, it just steams instead of, instead of sears. So if you've got too much, do it in smaller batches or get a bigger pan, but make sure you don't overcrowd it. So you can see that there's definitely color happening there and it's looking actually really good. So, there we go. So you're getting a little bit of brown on the, uh, on the onion. The thyme is coming through there a little bit. Now when you overcook these livers, this is the technique that you wanna pay attention to the most. If you overcook it, it's gonna become really mealy and dry and the texture is gonna be not right. So you kinda of gotta go against your instinct and say, okay, they need to be a little bit raw in the middle, just a little touch, not raw completely through, but you don't want them totally overcooked, okay? Um, so just be aware of that when you're doing it. So you can see that and you guys can see in that mirror, they're nice and brown. I've got a few little spots of raw there like that, but that's okay. So a nice little simple, it smells delicious, onions, butter, thyme, liver, okay? So once we get that kind of to the point that we want, which is right about there, um, and just to illustrate, what we're looking for here in the center. is just so, you can actually see some of the, kind of the blood starting to, like a steak, you know, rise to the surface and come out of the center. So heat is coming into the middle. And it's looking really good. So that's about it right there. And all you do is just basically dump it straight in. All right without making a mess. 
So we just tip that right into the food processor like that. And now with the pan still hot, we're gonna toss in the cognac. And this is really important. Now most time when you cook with alcohol, you usually let it totally cook off. Not in this case. I wanna remove it from the heat right away. Just bring the heat through it, steam a little bit so there's still lots of flavor in there. It's not all cooked out. And we'll throw that right in there too. And that's our, that's our, liquid, that's our liquid portion. Now the alcohol itself is cooked off. So it's okay, you know, it's not for underage kids, it's fine, the alcohol is gone, but you just don't want to totally reduce it down. Um, so don't go too far with it, real quick, just like that. Couple seconds off the heat and you're good to go. And right into the food processor. Now that that's done, we're just gonna tip straight in our cream, that's heavy cream. Salt, just for basic seasoning. And we're going to blitz this. So just a quick pulse. And don't worry about it coming completely smooth here, but you just want to get it all blitzed together and make it work. Now, this seems really runny, right? Looks really kind of off. and. So this is where it's okay, right? We've got all this butter to add to it yet, and then it's got to cool. So, you know, butter cooled congeals, it's a fat, we're gonna add that to that, and that's gonna kind of bring it all together, okay? So, we're just gonna kind of, now that that's in there, we're just gonna kind of throw that right in. And we'll blitz that one more time. And then the heat that's in there is going to slowly melt that butter. And it's still going to be a little runny, which is what you want. There's a hundred, about 175 grams there, so it's a little less than a, 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 around a stick, if you do the, by the pound with the. And the recipes are on the, the website. So again, that looks kind of runny, but that's what you want because, again, that's what we're looking for. We're going to pour that straight into the sieve. Now, if you were at home, you'd make sure you clean all that out and don't let any of that go to waste. That's pure deliciousness there. So, but here for speed's sake and everything else. And then what we're going to do is just gently pass it through a fine sieve strainer. These strainers are easy to come by. They're cheap, very handy. And what's going to be left is just a little bit of the thyme that the flavor's cooked out in, a little bit of that onion that we started off with. All the flavor is now in here and just the the leftover kind of debris and some of the even overcooked uh, liver will kind of just hold up in the, in the sieve. And then we'll just discard that. But we want to make sure we, you know, take your time, push it through, get the most you can out of it. So you can see we're not left with very much in there. But what we've got in the bottom here is basically our chicken liver pate. All right, now that's soft, of course, as I was saying, but once it cools, we get this. And as you can see, this texture is gorgeous, all right? So if you overcook it, uh, you will definitely not get that smoothness. It'll be really grainy, okay? So you'll know that you've kind of went too far with it. So make sure you just don't overcook the livers. And other than that, it's just in a pan, into the food processor, blitz, blitz, blitz. And this is absolutely to die for. It's 10 times better than anything you'll buy in the store. It's easy to make. It's impressive for friends that come over. You can pair it with bread, vegetables, you know. Um, and we're gonna actually show you how to make a nice little charcuterie plate uh, tomorrow uh, at one of our last demos. So that's as simple as pate gets. Now, you can take it to a step further. You can, sometimes you'll see pate in stores with a gel over the top. It's usually a pork fat gel or, but you can also just take butter, melt butter down and pour butter over the top and let that butter harden and that'll give you the same effect, right? It'll seal it and, uh, and then you can slice it, serve it on crackers uh, or anything else that you like. Really simple, 
Uh, great recipe, not much to it, um, but very impressive. All right, so we've got that to sample later. So that's the chicken liver pate. So next, we're gonna get into bread making. All right, now this is a recipe that I came up with because I love to make Asian-influenced marinated meats, and they go really wet on, uh, well on like a banh mi style bread. And that's like a French baguette that's not so hard on the outside that it tears the roof of your mouth apart when you're eating it. I'm sure you've all had that baguette where you're like, it's so good, but it's tearing my mouth apart because it's so crusty on the outside. So this bread recipe gives you that crusty effect, all right? but it's soft enough where it certainly is, is easy to eat. And the inside is super tender and, and really soft. And I'm gonna show you a hack, kind of a kitchen hack, as to how to make that happen. Um, so a lot of times in bread making, uh, a lot of companies will use conditioners. And those conditioners and preservatives is what adds up to that bread being soft after you bought it you know, 10 days ago. And you're thinking, how come there's no mold and it's still soft? Uh, it's all the conditioners and all the preservatives. So instead of going with the chemical, um, what we do is, is we put something in our bread that acts as a natural conditioner that uh, home bakers have been using for a long time. Um, and that is, um, we will get into that right now. As soon as I, there we go. So, let's just go through these ingredients first. So there's nothing complicated about this bread at all. The only thing that's complicated, nothing complicated except the only thing that's complicated, the only thing you've got to pay attention to is just the steps. Just be particular with the steps and be patient. And if you do that, everything else is okay, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is just go through the ingredients. All right, so we've got our flour, we've got our salt, we've got our sugar, we've got yeast, we've got shortening, and we've got gluten flour. And the secret ingredient I'm missing. The secret ingredient is a vitamin C tablet. So just your normal basic vitamin C that you buy in the store, it's a couple dollars for 100 tablets. One 500 milligram tablet goes into this recipe. And you can get liquid vitamin C or you can get the tablets. So I have the, can you grab me a tablet? Um, so the tablets, what I'll do is, he'll bring one up now in a moment. I'll just take a bowl like that that's flat and just crush it and get it crushed and just add it to my flour, okay? And that one little simple thing is gonna give you that very soft, tender inside, all right? Um, so we'll get to mixing this up now. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. So we will get to mixing this up. There we go. Thank you. So, you know, basic vitamin C tablet, nothing much to it. We take one out. Take a simple jar and just crush it, okay? Simple as that. All right, so this recipe is gonna make six of these beautiful little rolls, okay? So it's kind of a perfect amount to go through for a small family or... So we're gonna start with three cups of flour. A measuring cup. So we got three cups of flour. The one thing we're gonna hold off and add last is the salt. Salt is a, it won't kill yeast, but it'll slow it down, all right? So what we wanna do is get the yeast worked into our bread dough first, and we'll add our salt at the very, very end. And salt also acts as a way to hydrate. You add salt to something, it draws the moisture out. So as our flour is hydrating, it draws that water out and allows everything to mix together better, okay? 
So it's as simple as just in with the vitamin C tablet, in with the sugar. Now this is gluten flour. The gluten flour gives it the nice crust. This is available at Bulk Burn, and this is in every flour, okay? This is the gluten extracted from, every, from the white flour, and is just the gluten. So we've got one tablespoon of it. Doesn't take a whole lot. It's actually cheaper than flour, easy to get, um, and really, really comes in handy. So we're going to add one tablespoon of that. Next is vegetable shortening. It's best to melt this. It's always easiest. But if you don't melt it, I didn't melt it, um, you want to work it through first, almost as if you were making a uh, pie crust or a short crust. Just kind of get it broken up and just get it into your flour, OK? So, so far, we've got gluten flour, we've got our flour, we've got some um, shortening, we've got a little bit of sugar, um, and next, we're going to add our water and our yeast. Now, whenever you make bread, you read a lot of recipes about baking bread at home, um, and a lot of them will say, you know, the active dry yeast, just put it straight into the flour, and it will work. But if you want the best results in, in bread, always, 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 doesn't matter what you read or what you hear, Dissolve that yeast in warm water first. So if you're going to do a slow rise and you don't want it to be too aggressive, just put a little bit of warm water to dissolve your yeast, and the rest of your water that the recipe calls for you can put in cold. All right? But in this case, we're not looking for a slow rise. We're looking for a good steady rise. So we don't want the water to be too hot where we kill the yeast. We don't want it to be too cold where it takes too long to go. So about 110 degrees is what you're looking for. All right? Um, so with three cups of flour, we're going to go with around a cup and a quarter of water, okay? Which is basically that. So to follow my own rule, I'm going to take the yeast and a little bit of water. And what's nice is if you have a little uh, whisk, just whisk it and get it to dissolve. See the bubbles coming there? If you don't do this, the yeast sinks to the bottom, becomes like glue, and you go and pour the water into your bread and all the yeast is stuck to the bottom of your bowl. All right, so get a little whisk, whisk it, and what I'll do is I'll add this first, and if there is any residual yeast on the bottom of my bowl, I'll just do this when I, before I put the rest in. So that way I'm making sure that my recipe is getting all of the yeast. It's not sticking into the bottom of that bowl, okay? And this is where we just kind of, you can use a mixer, okay, if you want. It's perfectly acceptable. Actually, I think the recipe that I wrote, I, you know, had a mixer in there. Uh, but I like to do bread by hand because a lot of it is feel, all right, uh, for softness and for moisture. So I'm not overworking it. I'm not doing anything crazy. Uh, what I'm basically trying to do is combine those ingredients, okay? So I've got them combined. Now you may say to yourself, looking at that, that doesn't look right. You know, some people might say it's not coming together properly. I've made bread lots of times, not supposed to be like that. <laughs> you know, it might be just a couple people out there saying that. But when the ratios are right to begin with, the bread is going to take, the flour that we've used, is going to take time to hydrate. When the water hits it, it just doesn't automatically absorb. If you poured a bucket of water over yourself, it would take a while for the water to sink into your shirt and sink into your clothes, and some would fall on the floor. Bread is no different. So if I let this sit for five minutes untouched, it's going to get wetter and wetter. And the reason why is because the flour is taking that time to hydrate, all right, and the water is coming through that bread. So whenever you make bread and you get it combined, it might look rough and it might look craggy and it might look like you got a little bit left in the bottom. Just be patient. And that's where I say, I go back, be patient, let it sit for five minutes. And in five minutes, you'll have a completely different workable dough. And then you just kind of get your hands clean. And while I'm getting my hands clean, you know, I'm, I'm giving it that chance to set and to hydrate. And we'll just kind of uh, imagine that we wait at five minutes. And then from there, you just knead it, okay? So as we knead this, we're going to be actually working that gluten, and it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher. And as it gets tougher, that means we've got to let it relax. So after we work it, we've got to let it relax. So I'm just going to work it through. So when you knead bread, 
or you're needing anything, even pasta dough. Um, from the, from the, the back to the front, and then out again, and then quarter turn, okay? So from the front to the back, out, quarter turn, all right? And I'm just going to kind of speed this up now, but that's the basic movement that we're making, okay? You shouldn't need any extra flour on your surface, all right? You want a little bit of tackiness. Bread should be tacky. It should never be slippery and smooth. There should be good hydration. Good hydration is going to be a moister bread. It's not going to be as dry. It's going to, have, it's going to be more, more palatable and, and pleasant when you eat it. So that's it. That's the bread together. Now, at this point in time, it's all together. It's de and we got to add our salt. And this is where I like to add the salt. And when I add this salt, it's going to get wetter instantly, okay? Uh, because it's just going to draw uh, some of that moisture that's in that bread out. All right, so we're just going to work that in. And that way, by adding it at that stage, it has no effect on the yeast at all, all right? The yeast is already protected with the flour and the other ingredients. And now we just kind of want to work it in. So if you've got a mixer, you can avoid all this kneading, all right? You don't have to do this, but for when you get into the hang of, of doing bread, there's something more enjoyable about doing it all by hand, you know? It's just pleasant. And this is a nice batch to work with. Sometimes if you get a big batch, you really, that becomes hard to work. You know, you can see some of these uh, kind of uh, nanas, you know, the Italian grandmothers, you know, they get the pasta dough and they're just driving in it, but it's a big ball and they want to do it by hand. But this recipe is nice. You'll get six of these and it's kind of easy to work with. It's not a large amount of dough, okay? So <clears throat> this is about ready to, what I'm going to say is the first proof, okay? So what I normally do is I'll take a little bit of oil. It's not necessary, but it's just a good general practice. And just kind of give it a coat, okay? Back in the bowl, covered. 45 minutes or best way to go is double in size. So when that's doubled in size, you're ready to move forward, okay? So it just so happens with the magic of demos, We've got one doubled in size, <laughs> just like that. Imagine if it was like that at home, I'm eating bread every day. So we've got it doubled in size, and you can kind of see how nice that is. All right. It's soft, it's, it's tacky, but it's not sticky. All right, tacky and sticky are two very different things, okay? So once we get it to that uh, stage, we basically want to, I just like to do that for ease. Um, I'll go old school. So if you've got a knife, you can cut it. Uh, if you want to go old school like the pizza makers, all right, you know you're going to get six loaves out of Each one should be around 130 grams. Um, you can make it any size you want. Um, so I'm a little off there on my twisting, but close enough. All right, so once we get it into our balls, we got six. And you can just kind of shape them. And if you struggle shaping them like this, because I've rolled out 5,000 million buns, so I can kind of do that. It takes a, huh? You can do that. Just basically fold the edges back onto one another. All right, and basically what you're trying to do when you do that is tighten the outside surface. So you're drawing the outside surface around to get that smooth kind of surface on the ball, yeah? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Nice little even, easy recipe, all right? So that's 45 minutes in, we're at, the, we're at this stage, or until it was doubled in size. So now, because we've worked that dough again, that's a little tough. Like it's soft, but it's tough. So whenever you're working with that, you've got to give it a minute to relax again, okay? So we've got to imagine that we've had a little bit of time to let these relax, okay? So five minutes is good but it needs that five minutes, okay? So again, I'm just gonna try to use my skills to cut that five minutes out 
and show you what happens after five minutes. So if you've got a rolling pin, you can certainly roll it out in a rolling pin. Uh, but what happens, just to go back to my point about gluten, is that if it doesn't relax, this is what happens. When I do that, it, naturally, it pulls itself back in. I don't know if sometimes you made pizza crust and you're rolling it out, and as you're rolling it out, it keeps shrinking back, and you roll it out and it shrinks. The reason why is your dough is not rested. If you wait 10 minutes and then roll it out, it'll take the shape that you're rolling. So this is where patience really is the secret ingredient to this recipe, because there's very little work and effort to it. It's just mixing a few ingredients, kneading, and then, uh, and then waiting, really. So I'm just going to kind of force this out. And I'm going to try to get it out into a nice round, I'm going to say five inch circle, okay? And if you want to go with your hands, just kind of push from the center so it's nice and even, out to the edges. So from the center out to the edges, and kind of work that dough out, okay? So that's, so just to recap, we've mixed our ingredients. We've given that, when we mix it, we've given it a chance to hydrate, added our salt, knead it a little bit, let it rest, double in size, put it in the balls, then from balls into round, flat, even discs of dough. And then when you go to roll it to form this, we're going to take it from the front and the back and we're going to meet in the middle, okay? So we're going to pull this in like that. And this is where you want that dough to be a bit tacky, okay? If it's too much flour on there, forget it. It's just not going to roll. It's going to totally come undone, all right? So we start like that. And then from the other edge, can we see that back out there? See that from the mirror? So we're taking that in like that, see? And then I'm just going to pinch all the way along that seam. And you want to pinch hard, get that nice and sealed. And you can see that shape that's coming. I'm going to roll that over. And then it's nice to have parchment. Uh, parchment's really good. If you don't use it, I strongly recommend you start. It's cheap. And it makes all the difference in cooking, roasting in the oven, uh, things like bread. Um, it just, it, it changes the, re the end result. So it's definitely worth the investment. Um, of course, I got a full roll here. So then all we're going to do is lay it on like that. And again, just repeat. So you can see that in that couple of minutes, from the first one to the last one, this one here is already easier to roll out. So I'm just going to do one more. Pinch, 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 roll. And done, okay? So now, again, we've waited 45 minutes for it to get to a point where we can bring it to this. And then what we're going to do is we're going to wait another 45 minutes until that's ready for the oven. All right? So I'm just going to talk now about some things that you want to keep in mind while you're waiting. So at this stage, you're 45 minutes away from the oven, okay? So in 45 minutes when this rises up to that size, and I would have had that to illustrate, but our demo times got shifted a bit, so I do apologize for that. But normally I would show you exactly when these are ready for the oven, and they're gonna be, they would be about the size of this, okay? So that will proof into this, all right? So as soon as you get these rolled out, Get your oven on four, basically the hottest, 475, 500, okay? And put a pan of water on the bottom rack, all right? And that's, that's prepping your oven. So at this stage, prep your oven. High heat, water, pan of water. And then when this comes to rise, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I don't have a knife. 
When this comes to rise and before it goes into the oven, what you want to do is make a slit straight down the middle. All right? So just make a small cut right across there. And you can brush with a little bit of oil. And turn, then your oven's on hot. Turn it down to 425. Bake for 22 minutes. And then at 22 minutes, you shut your oven off. All right? Leave the bread in there for another 10 minutes with the door closed. All right? And what that's going to do is the steam from that water, after you shut your oven heat off, is going to soften the outside of that bread. So you're left with a nice crunchy bread, which is attributed to the gluten flour, but it's not gone too hard because you've let it soften in a slow heat that's got water steaming in the pan. All right, so the balance of the two gives you that nice texture, okay? So prepping the oven is critical to the success of this recipe. So high heat, pan of water, turn your heat down, buns in, when they're ready, keep, turn the oven off, keep the oven door closed. And what you'll get, uh, Jacobson, give me a knife. What you'll get is this beautiful, beautiful bread. Now I've got some of this bread if you just want to try the bread. I've got some pate if you just want to try the pate. But we've also got the bread and the pate done for you. And in one of our earlier demos today, we did some pickled vegetables. So we took some of the pickled cucumber uh, that we did this morning, and we just topped on the toast with the pate and with the bread. And it is just absolutely delicious to eat, all right? And then tomorrow, we're going to be showing how to use the, all these things that we're doing to build a nice charcuterie plate with some cheese and some meats and talk about how to kind of build that at home. So... Um, if anybody wants to come up, anybody got any questions? Anybody curious about anything? Was that clear? The recipe is kind of detailed, so you can read through it. Um, and I'm just going to illustrate kind of the inside of this bread. Thanks. I don't know if you guys can see, it's super soft, all right? Uh, the ingredients we used are all natural. There's no, nothing nasty in there. Um, and it's just an absolutely delicious bread. Okay? So anyone who wants to come up for a sample, I encourage you to come up and, uh, and give it a try. Pass some out there, Jacob. Thank you, everyone.